Welcome to the Drama Teacher Podcast, brought to you by Theatre Folk, the Drama Teacher Resource Company. I'm Lindsay Price. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. This is episode 198, and you can find any links to this episode in the show notes, which are at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 198. Have you ever heard a teacher say, my students could never do that? It always shocks me a little. Now, granted, I am not a full-time teacher. I'm not a teacher. I'm not in the classroom. And perhaps when a teacher says, my students could never do that, there's a good reason. But I have a a very vivid memory from about 10 years ago when I was at a, a school and they were working on one of my plays and I was talking to the students and I said, you guys always seem seem really confident. You seem so confident on stage. That's amazing. And one of the students said to me, well, our teacher believed in us. She never thought that we couldn't do it. And so we thought the same. I just love that. I love that just to have a student, when someone believes in you, that's a very powerful feeling, isn't it? So today we're talking to a teacher who had that same feeling and she wanted to go big with her group. And big meant putting on a musical with her middle school students at the international school where she worked. So let's hear her story, shall we? See you on the other side. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am talking to Kimberly Mack today. Hello, Kimberly. Hi. Now, I know over the summer that you are uh, uh, you are stateside, right? Yes, ma'am. But tell everybody where you usually are during the year. I normally teach over in Lijiang, which is in Yunnan province in China. So it's down southwest. That was... Um... That was an awesome pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I've sure been you, working on I, that. Well, I'm sure you must have to say it quite a bit. But uh, okay, so you are you are an internet. You are te- are you teaching in an inter- international school or do you teach um, uh, Chinese students? Um, yes, I, it is an international school, but we have Chinese, Indian, Korean, and American students there. Oh, okay, so what is it like? So let's start with that. What is it like to have such a multicultural uh, base, a student base? Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, I went there right after college, so it was my very first uh, experience as a teacher. And it was neat because here we are getting to share the American culture with all of these students, um, teaching them English. Some of them would come into our school knowing absolutely nothing of English. And we got to start from the ground up and see them progress. And it's just been really amazing opportunity. All right. So now that leads very naturally to my next question. Okay. So you, uh, how long have you been teaching? Um, two years. Two years. So yes. what about teaching um, has been a surprise for you? Um, I guess the biggest thing is how much these students are, they're able to pick up so quickly, but yet they're reading these in- English words, but then they have no idea what the meanings are because they just don't translate. So here you're having to tell not just the word, but the meaning and explain these things that would be common words in America. Cool. Okay. So that's the student experience. Now, what about your experience just being a teacher? Like what, cause I'm sure what was your, what was, that's okay. What was your expectation of being a teacher and, uh, and how has that played out? Um, I've actually always wanted to be a teacher since, uh, my parents were both teachers for 20 plus years. So it's been like a dream come true in a way. It's been really hard um, being in a different country, trying to be able to um, get used to the culture as well as trying to fit in times to uh, learn the language as top of teaching and everything that comes with it. So it, it was a lot more work than I was anticipating. Well, teaching is hard enough as it is. I think like then add in the, uh, the, the cultural aspect um, you must be exhausted all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> was it your, was it your, um, did you, did you know you wanted to, uh, try out? Cause I know lots of folks, um, when they get out of school, they, uh, they head over overseas and, and, and try 
just because it's a great opportunity to travel to try out an international school or uh, how did you end up in China? The short story is this is something I've always wanted to do since sixth grade myself was go to China. Um, so I was able during college uh, to connect with this international school and I thought that that would be an amazing opportunity to be able to pursue this lifelong dream of going to China and teaching at the same time. Well, you've got it all, man. You've got, you've got, you've got it all. Uh, you've got like the teaching dream and the China dream. And then they all, they all came together in this. Uh, they did. They did. <laughs> so uh, the reason that, uh, that you and I are talking today is that um, you shared with me a, a pretty fascinating story in that um, at your school, uh, you, you, you had an experience with the sound of music. Uh, yes, I did. Which I think is, uh, first of all, it's pretty awesome. But I think that what you you said is that first of all, you were just going to you're just going to play with the book of the sound of music and and just getting used to the English. But then you dove in with both feet and and actually produced the music as well. Yes, ma'am, we did. All right. So tell me about a. Well, let's start with your decision to try the sound of music and why the sound of music um, with your uh, with your students. What was that all about? Okay, uh, this kind of came from a um, couple different reasons. I've always loved that uh, movie. It's one of my favorites forever. And while I um, asked to teach speech my second year, and we actually moved our school school location. So we were going through our library and we actually found a copy of the play. So here I had this play. I wouldn't have to sit and type something up or create my own version of anything. I was able to pull from the book that already had it written out for us. So that was part of the reason. Um, I wanted to do a large production for the end of the year to try to help generate funds for the school and draw people in. Um, I've been responsible for plays the last two years, and the other ones were just shorter things that maybe lasted 30 minutes, 45 minutes max, because I normally would write them myself. And so here I was wanting to do something that would be a little bit longer and be able to um, draw people in. Okay, and then when you went to uh, went to your students and said we're doing the sound of music, what was that? That what was their response? It was a mixed response, actually. Two of the girls had seen the movie in Chinese, and they loved it, and they were so excited. They said they already knew all of the songs, and they were just so excited to be able to be cast in it. The boys were not so sure at the beginning. Um, they were not very thrilled at the thought of having all of these lines put on them. But as we started working at it, they actually all ended up falling in love with the uh, plot line of The Sound of Music, and it was pretty awesome to see. Why do you think that is? What was it about the plot line that that spoke to uh, spoke to um, spoke to that community? I think it was something um, because they were able to, for the first time, not only um, watch this in their own language to understand it better, since they do have the movie in Chinese. So they were able to really understand what was going on. But also, I think they were able to anticipate this as a challenge and see that they were able to overcome this giant obstacle of this production. Um, and they put jumped in both feet and were a great help with me trying to get this produced. Okay, so what uh, I, I think that challenge is always a uh, sometimes that is the best motivator, right? Like that's something. This is a hurdle that, that I, I have to be able to do this. It's 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 just a musical, <laughs> right? Just a musical, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> okay, so when you so when they were you moving forward, how did you uh, how did you approach it? How did you approach um, getting it on its feet? I started with um, actually bringing the movie in and we watched some of it on my um, computer to try to get them a little bit familiar with it um, in the English version. And I, since day one, so they already all had their parts and we were just going to tackle this with lots of extra practices and that I thought they could do it and they needed to prove to me that they could do it. 
And it probably helped that that was their exam grade, too. Aha. See, challenge and a grade. I think that uh, all of a sudden, (laughs) all of a sudden, it's becoming quite clear why this was a success. (laughs) So so your approach was to, so you didn't hold auditions. You you precast the show. Yes, I did. And, uh, And why did you decide to do that? Um, a few reasons. One, we only had 13 students in the speech class, so it was very small group to work with. And I had, like I said, I had thought about doing the sound of music since August and here it was March where we were actually starting to do it. So I'd been watching them and seeing who I thought would do well in each part Also, we still had a few kids who were um, nervous about speaking English in front of people. So I didn't want them to feel like they had to audition. And because they did poorly, they got a certain role. I prefer to just cast them all myself based on what I had seen of them and how they had grown that year. Yeah, it takes a lot of the pressure off if it's if it's something because that is auditioning is uh, an added pressure all on its own. Right. Okay, so that's uh, and, and how. So let's talk about the because we have a lot of um, we have a lot of folks who in in their own communities are uh, working with English as a second language, and a lot of them are trying to figure out ways that they can include them in their in their drama classes and, and figure out a way to um, uh, really help them connect. So how did you how did you help them connect if they were uh, when they were struggling? Our school uh, was really great at helping me with that in the sense they had um, an ESL class for the ones who came in just the year before knowing no English. And um, that was one concern that they had when I approached them asking for the speech class was that we had four of the 13 had just started learning English the year before. So they were concerned that their English level wouldn't be up to par And so they had this ESL class and um, in speech, we had been going through a lot of things leading up to this production. And then during the practices, we spent a lot of times with a few of them um, with their pronunciation and their words and not only the pronunciation, but how they should say it with their expressions and things like that. I see. And how much time did they spend on... um on comprehension and that kind of thing. Like, did they, were they, did they, did they translate it into their, into their native language and, and make sure they understood it that way? Or did they just, was it just like a lot of rote or how did they work on their comprehension? A little bit of both. I had one student in particular who I saw his script and he had written all the Chinese above every one of his lines. So he did that to help him um, understand the meanings. I did have an assignment for them to watch at least their part in Chinese so that they would be able to hear it and understand what their character was supposed to be saying or getting across to everybody else. And then we did some rote memorization as well. How long did you uh, how long did you work on the show? We started uh, about March, and we performed it the first week of June, so about three months. Math says that that's <laughs> yes. I had to sit there. And think uh, did about you? That. Did uh, that's okay. I'm like I have no. I the, my worst thing is when I I have to like go into a class and I'm like I'm like I have to make groups and I'm like okay, there's 23 of you. I want four groups. I'm like oh, just figure it out yourselves. I can't. I can't even. I can't even. Did you think that that was enough time for them? I had wanted a little bit more time, honestly, but we were able to uh, spend extra time with extra practices that I penciled in the last couple of weeks. My problem was we only had speech class Mondays and Fridays, so I only had them two days a week. And any teacher knows that Mondays and Fridays are the most days that are taken off for holidays. So in those three months, I had about three different holidays and we missed these classes. So we had to make it up with extra practices penciled in, but it did turn out to be um, a good amount of time at the end. Yeah. And, uh, and as they, uh, as they, as they rehearsed, um, how did they change? Yeah, it was great to see the change in the sense of they were the first month or so they they were just strictly reading their lines 
and they weren't putting any of their own emotion behind it or getting that feeling across. And I think that was probably one of my biggest challenges was to tell them, hey, you're a real person on stage. You know, you need to be able to move like people move. Don't just stand there and get some of this uh, movement coming into it and putting their own personalities inside. I think the biggest change was watching was um, the boy who played the captain and that scene where he yells at Maria um, on the after the children come out of the water and they're in their clothing from the curtains and he just you know yells at her. It was really neat to see this boy. He started really, really yelling at her and he ended up losing his voice when practice because he was yelling so loud and so harsh and just putting tons of emotion into this um, character. Oh, that's an interesting, because uh, I thought that story was going to go in a different direction, <laughs> but uh, do you, do, no, 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 it's perfect, because, uh, but it, did, did the, did the cultural, were the cultural differences ever come into play with these guys, uh, these, these students trying to put on um, different characters? Did you ever have a, to have some discussions about, I can't do this because of, of my background, um, and just having that discussion about the, the fact that, uh, that they're, they're trying to play other people who aren't them? Yes, we actually did have that come up, especially um, with the a boy who played Rolf and he, you know, Rolf turns Nazi at the end. And ah, yes, this, that was a really uh, struggle for him to accept this fact. But we, we had this talk and for Franz, who is the Butler, they don't have these butlers like this and they wouldn't treat them like they did. And so just, we did have that come up with a few of the boys, especially. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that it's the, that it, that it, that that was an issue with the boys instead of the girls? I think because the girls maybe mainly played just the family scene, so they weren't really anything that different from the stage of life they were in at the time, other than the age differences. Whereas the boys were playing more variety of um, people. You had, like I said, Rolf, who is this telegram, and he delivery man and he turns into Nazi and you have the butler and Uncle Max who's this charismatic character who just loves money and loves being with the rich people and I think that was a little harder for them to grasp um, at the stage of life that they're in and understand how that thought process would go for those characters. What an interesting what an interesting thing to think about in that um, not only is that that the, the guys are in it's a uh, not being able to comprehend a stage of life, a certain stage of life, but that the girls may be in the same stage of life and that it wasn't necessarily their ethnicity. It was just being a girl and about how that maybe translates. Right. Right. You know, wherever, wherever you're from, I just, I I love, uh, my, uh, my, my favorite thing is learning similarities, um, similarities and differences. You know, when you go someplace completely new and you, and you, the differences are the things that usually jump out at you. But when you find out like, Oh no, you react to that exactly the same way that I do. I just, you know what I mean? Like, right. That that must happen to you every day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We have seen a few of that happen. Yes. (laughs) So you, you also identified that uh, your students painted and helped create the set and learned to uh, sew, sew the play clothes. Was this the first time that they had done that kind of thing? As far as I know, yes, that was. And And what what was that like for them? It was um, amazing for them. Really stressful for me. But (laughs) (laughs) I I got it. (laughs) um, I don't actually sew very well myself. So I had to contact some outside help for that and um, bring them in. So there was the scheduling of that. Uh, I had I'm not an artist at all either so I had our art teacher pencil in the background and then we just painted I figured I could help paint Uh, so to oversee this it was fascinating that we split it up to where the girls did the sewing and the boys did the set and the girls loved it and they loved being able to create these clothes and they always were asking me oh are we gonna sew today and I'm like uh no (laughs) <laughs> and then the boys were the boys were great. They loved getting messy and paint all over themselves. And 
it was just something that I had wanted to do to help get them to feel responsible and try to put maybe a little bit more effort into this play, knowing that they had helped with it. And I think it turned into a great learning opportunity for all of them and the different things that they were able to do with that. Well, that, you know, then now you're starting to get into some like some life skills that uh, are happening here, too. You know, that there's there's resp- there's uh, there's working as a group to make something come together, you know, as opposed to I just have my part and I have my lines. Right. Right. For sure. I just think that's wonderful. You know, like just to get uh, just to uh, and also to understand that there are are multi- many, many roles in putting something together, you know, that, you know, sets don't appear magically and neither do costumes. Unfortunately, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what was the, what was the performance like for them? How did they, what did they think was going to happen and, and how did they respond? Okay. Um, like I said, we had been putting a lot of time into these extra practices but we only had a few actual dress rehearsals. And I think that was one of the harder things for them because here they're actually now having to practice, of course, changing into their many different outfits um, for the first time in a crunch time. Um, And then the location that we were going to, we actually did not have microphones because we couldn't find enough microphones for everybody. So they had to do it on their own. And I think that was one of their biggest things when we went to the location and had these dress rehearsal. They were like, wait a minute, I now have to be extra loud to project my voice. Um, And the production itself went uh, extremely well. We had, I had some extra help backstage to get the kids changed on time. There was a few mishaps, of course, and the children just kept going. By that time, we had learned how to just uh, keep the lines moving was the biggest thing I think I was stressing to them because we had many practices where people weren't there and so other children had to say their lines and they just show that they were really uh, listening in these different practices because they did it that night and a lot of the audience said it looked flawless to them even though here I am nitpicking it because I know what's supposed to be going on. Well, that's the thing you know, you always tell them is that an audience has no idea that you've made a mistake until you tell them by breaking character. Your, or, right. Or your facial expressions and things. Or your yes. facial expressions. Yeah. I think that's yeah. the, you know, anytime that, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the point where I get the, a, a knot in the pit of my stomach when you can see that something has gone awry on stage, but no one is helping. Like no one is co- coming in and jumping in. It's like somebody, somebody do something. Yes. Yes. There so is that's this, pretty awesome. Yeah, there was this one time particularly uh, where after Maria and the captain got married, they were supposed to come out on stage, but Maria was changing and I didn't know she was because that was the first time she decided to change. And so the kids come out, father, mother, you're home. And mother is not there, but father said her <laughs> line for her. And it was, it, it was really great. And she just came right out at her next line and said it and just kept it moving. And it was, it was it was good. Out, no one in the audience when I asked them about it said that they noticed anything. So I was Aww. feeling great that they just kept it going. Oh, that's the awesomest. That's the best. <laughs> that it was just like you know they're not nothing's gonna phase them now. You know exams. What's an exam? I I like covered <laughs> for someone on stage. Right. Right. Okay, so as we wrap this up, so you've done it, and now you've you've been you've had it, ha- you've had the experience. What's what was the big takeaway for you for for putting something up like this? I think the biggest thing was just, um, you know, to show the positivity. I don't even know if that's a word, um, but to show that positive attitude. Yes, it is now <laughs> that positive attitude to the kids. And when I expected great things from them, they came out and just did it. Um, they, and so to keep that positive attitude going and expect great things from them and tell them that I expect them to do it well, so they better do it. I think that was one of the biggest things as well as learning how to correct with kindness and not just correct and lash out at them for missing something, but trying to show them why it was important to do it the way that we had practiced and that, these everyone else depends on each other for these lines oh i love that phrase correct with kindness you know like it's uh 
this isn't this isn't we're not uh it's not uh brain surgery or rocket science it's putting on a play right you know? <laughs> right and i want them to have fun but we got to be able to have fun with each other but i also having fun but then with high expectations i think that is the that's the balance you know it's not just running around and uh and being all loosey-goosey it's like i expect better of you i expect good of you and that and that you can do this um, that is a lovely, that's, I think that is the, I think that's the best takeaway from, from any experience is that to, to set expectations and also to, uh, incorrect with kindness. I, I think that's great. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> you're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience uh, today, Kimberly. Uh, it's been a, it's been a lovely talk. Of course. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you, Kimberly. Before we go, let's do some theater folk news. So any links to today's episode can be found in the show notes at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 198. So it's the beginning of the year, and it's a time where a lot of folks are starting rehearsals for spring shows. So I just thought this would be a great time to point out um, some of the steps you need to take when producing a show particularly around royalties, right? When do you need to purchase royalties? Can I get a discount if I'm not charging admission? Why do I have to pay royalties if I'm not charging admission? So we have a great FAQ page over on Theater Folk with all of these questions answered. I've put a link into the show notes. Um, so let's just go over a, a couple of those thoughts about royalties. When do you need to purchase royalties? Well, a royalty is just like a rental fee. You pay a fee when you rent a car, right? You rent a car and then you have to give it back, right? You don't get to keep the car. You don't change the color of the car. You just pay the fee, rent the car. So it's the same thing with a play. You pay a fee when you put on a play, any play. And that's how the playwright gets paid. People ask us all the times, well, why aren't the plays just fee? Particularly because we're in education. Well, it should be educational. The play should be free. Well, it, somebody wrote that play and they own that play. Even we don't own the play here at Theatre Folk. Uh, we are just representing the play. And uh, I always like to say you wouldn't, you wouldn't ask your dentist if you can get a free cleaning. Uh, so you can't have the play for free. Uh, and royalties come into play whenever there is an audience. It doesn't matter if they're paying audience. It doesn't matter if they're just a friends and family audience. If someone's watching their play and they're quiet, either they're on the floor or they're in chairs and they applaud at the end, you bow, it's an audience and there's a royalty fee. Uh, when you're on our website, all the information for how much the royalty is for each title, because for each title, it's going to be different. It's right there on the plays page. And that's the best, uh, the best thing that you can do. If you're having questions, if you're looking for information about a certain title, go to the page that is on the website and uh, have a little search around there. And you are going to find all the information you are looking for. And again, have a look at the FUQ page. If you have any questions about royalties or click on the link in the show notes, which are at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode one nine eight. Finally, where can you find this podcast? Go to theaterfolk.com forward slash podcast. And there you'll see we're on iTunes, Android, Google Play, Stitcher, and more. That's theaterfolk.com slash podcast. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care.